So let's uh, we'll pray and then we'll get started. Okay. Um, let's pray, right? Father, we thank you for this uh, for this new day that you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity that you've given us, Lord, to to gather, Lord, um, around your presence, around your word. And this morning, even as we do that, Lord, Father God, we pray that uh, you would speak to us. Lord, we pray that you would show us, um, Lord, insights from your word. I pray let your word convict us, strengthen us, Lord, produce faith in us, Lord. Even as uh, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God, and um, and I just pray, Father God, that you will build us up in the inner man. I pray that, uh, Lord, as as we look um, through these, um, uh, Lord, through your word, I pray that uh, we will understand your word even more clearly. I pray that uh, your word will shed light on things that we did not know earlier, and also, Father God, I pray that um, Lord um, would give ourselves completely, Lord to the leading of the Holy Spirit and to the doctrine of Father God, and so that our progress may be evident to all, as your word uh, declares, uh, Father God, we commit ourselves to this, and we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, let's uh, continue from where we stopped. Um, so we've been going through all the chapters, all the verses in Corinthians. And uh, yeah, so last class was uh, on 1 Corinthians 11, right? About, um, uh, I mean, of course, we looked at uh, 10 also, and then we uh, we looked at 11, and we I think we went all the way up to uh, 22, or, or verse 16, right? Um, and I think uh, we need to continue with verse 17 onwards. Um, yeah, but I just want to know if uh, if there are any uh, questions, if there are any doubts um, uh, based on what we looked at um, so far. Any questions, any doubts? Um, Anything at all? See, uh, we looked at some very important um, aspects, right? One of these was about uh, the uh, the whole thing of idol, uh, idolatry and food of the idols, and Paul uh, talking about that and bringing a you know a completion to that particular topic, which was bothering the Corinthians, which was uh, re really a problem there um, because of the culture, because of the kind of uh, um, you know environment they were in. Um, so we we looked at that, um, and uh, we also looked at. Uh, the whole aspect of head covering, okay. Now, head covering, which could be, uh, and we saw that some things are cultural, some things are uh, meant for, uh, you know, a, a particular people and a place and a time, and and uh, certain other things which we see in the world are are universal in the sense it's applicable across time and to all uh, people. And all congregations, all people across churches. So, uh, some are exclusively for that particular church. And uh, in the Corinthian church, uh, this head covering, while uh, Paul talks about that, he also addresses uh, another important aspect, which is headship, right? Headship and head covering, uh, two different things. One is a physical act. One is, a, you know, it could be traditional, cultural, which is head covering. The other thing being headship, which is divine order and uh, a divine order or authority and uh, how God has placed this in the uh, church, right? Um, either it's husband, wife, or, um, you know, the, the spiritual leader and the people in the church and so on. The divine order that God established uh, establishes in the church, right? So uh, he addresses both in um, chapter 11. So any, any questions, any doubts in this? See, I know that we are all... Um, you know, culturally, we have seen, uh, or maybe you yourself, you know, cover your, uh, you know, your head when it comes to worship. And I've seen it, you know, in certain places, uh, uh, maybe not so much in the city, but uh, definitely in the rural villages, in the rural side, and so on. So we've seen that. So there's nothing wrong in that. You know, if people want to do it, that's fine. Um, 
but uh, we should be just aware why people do it and it's uh, it's not something that is mandated okay there was a reason why paul said you know if a woman prays or prophesies with her head uncovered it is it is shameful you know if if her head is uncovered let her be shown or um, let the head be shaved you know it's it's equivalent to that so there is there's a reason we we looked at that right so any questions or doubts regarding that uh, we should be clear in our minds uh, about this so if there are any questions we will we will address that right um anything at all okay no doubts no questions it's clear okay so i just want to know like what is your understanding of it then you know what is your understanding of head covering so what do you think do you think women should cover their heads um you know you plant a church you start a church so what will you teach will you ask women to cover their heads if so why and uh, if you're not going to do that uh, then you know why again the reason right um the reason should be clear so so that's the thing anyone you can put it in the chat um you can unmute and share as well anyone thomas would you like to share um do you have that in uh, uh you know do you yeah yeah yes pastor um yeah so have you encountered these kind of challenges have you uh, yeah so... yeah actually when mm. uh, i was in another ministry for almost 5 years as associate pastor uh, okay. this kind of issues are not raised because some people when women are arguing this sister mm-hmm. not head covering that sister is not head covering uh, we have to tell pastor we have to teach them like that uh, many sisters um. used to come and tell mm. so mm. i used to go for the context it's uh, more than a head covering it should not mm. become a ritual yeah so i used to explain why paul explains that and what is the background of this verse so it's not matter about covering or not covering it's matter of the obeying the word it says that it's a, a matter of sub- submission under the men or a husband like an authority mm. Uh, that's what it's it's really mean so i'll encourage if if you want you can cover but if yeah. if somebody's not covering don't force them okay <laughs> that's uh, depend on them it's matter yeah. about obeying the word of god that's how right. i used to tell oh that's good i think that's good advice yeah okay right so um so the so this is the context in which paul shares this right so um so we need to understand that and if you personally feel that okay um you know i need to cover my head like i'm talking to the women of course um just go ahead and do it there's nothing wrong you know you're you're doing it uh, unto god uh, as an, but uh you know there's no need to force others to do it right um because scripturally when we see we don't see that as something that's uh, applicable across churches because paul um in in verse 16 one Corinthians 11 and verse 16 he uh, wraps wraps up that whole discussion and he says if anyone seems to be contentious right we have no such custom okay nor do the churches of god okay so so that's something for you personally to uh, to understand for us personally to understand and also if people ask right if people have doubts if people have questions uh, we can always share and teach them you know from uh from what we have learned um the context and of course it's going to be you know we need to be a little patient and because they say this is this is how we've done all these years you know why should we change and so on so uh so we can you know share from the word and, and also you know leave them with that verse 16 where, where Paul says we do not have such customs but you know the fact is if if you want to do it do it right okay okay so today uh let's look at uh, verse verses 17 onwards Okay, which talks about uh, uh, the lord's uh, the, the lord's table or uh, um, communion okay uh, the lord's supper 
So let's uh, let's read through. Uh, now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you. I, since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. One is hungry and other is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Okay, so, so here he's uh, uh, Paul is talking about a specific uh, thing which is not in order. Okay, uh, and it's this whole issue of communion, and what was happening is, uh, you know, instead of recognizing why or acknowledging why they were taking part in the communion, and why they were doing this, uh, and also the the which, you know. Uh, acknowledging the what they were doing, um, so here we see that the Corinthian believers had actually, you know, moved away from that truth, and what was happening was um, uh, instead of really uh, enjoying or um, you know walking in the truth with regard to communion, they had uh, there was confusion. Uh, and what was the confusion? The confusion was that one person would. Uh, you know, they they would. It had become a meal. It had become a, 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 a cause for gathering and eating and drinking. And also, the fact was that one person would, you know, take the food and eat it, and there was there was not enough for the other person. And so, um, so that is what Paul wants to address now. So um, let's read verses. 23 to 26 so he shares about uh, uh, what the lord did and also the revelation that he received the instruction that he received from the lord right verses 23 onwards um, for i received from the lord that which i also deliver to you that the lord jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Okay. So, um, so this is what the Lord Jesus did. This is what the Lord Jesus said when he was with his disciples, and uh, it was the, the night in which he was betrayed. So um, he takes the bread and he says, "You know, you do this in remembrance for me, remembrance of me." And he gives the bread to his disciples. Right in the, in the same manner, he takes the cup, uh, and you, you notice that you know he took the cup after supper. So which means that it was something that was done symbolically, something that was done. Um, after supper, after they had had the meal, right? So they got gathered together. They um, they um, they had the meal, and then after that, this was done as a symbolic act, right? So he says, uh, uh, "This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me." So he says, uh, "What the bread signifies, what the cup." That they're going to drink off what that signifies. And he says, in both cases, do this in remembrance of me. So Paul actually um, quotes the words of the Lord Jesus. And uh, and he says, you know, this is what, what I received from the Lord. And, uh, and then verse 27 onwards, uh, let's read that. Verse 27 to 34. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, 
eats and drinks judgment to himself and not discerning the lord's body for this reason many are weak and sick among you and many sleep for if we would judge ourselves we would not be judged but when we are judged we are chastened by the lord that we may not be condemned with the world therefore my brethren when you come together to eat wait for one another but if anyone is hungry let him eat at home lest you come together for judgment and the rest i will set in order when i come okay so what is the purpose you know uh, he goes on to explain in verses 23 to 26 the purpose of the lord's table or the purpose of communion okay so uh, what was it it was actually a proclamation right a declaration and what was it proclaiming what was it declaring it was declaring uh, and and uh, you know it was a, it was proclaiming it was is sort of a you know a loud proclamation but yet without words right it was without words that action itself proclaimed something to uh, you know to uh, people who are there around people who were uh, watching and uh, to the powers of darkness to god it was a proclamation it was by the believer what was it that all our sins have been paid for have been taken care of because of what the lord jesus did on the cross all our sins have been taken care of it's been paid for the second one is that the power of sin is broken that sin does not have any dominion over your life because that is what uh, the lord jesus accomplished on the cross that the power of sin is broken that he removed our sickness because by his stripes we are healed um the punishment for sin was being paid by the lord so we don't have to carry that the consequence of that we don't have to carry uh, every curse of the law was broken uh, and so we don't have to be uh, coming under that curse instead of it you know we can receive the blessings of abraham right and the uh, power of satan satan himself was and the powers of darkness were the the authority the power was actually destroyed the hold was broken right and and the fact that we are god's possession that we've been redeemed from sin and we've been set free and we are now uh, we belong to the lord jesus so all this we proclaim we declare when we take part in the communion okay so it's a very powerful declaration when we you know what happens when we declare the word of god when we agree with the truth of god's word we experience the the truth when we walk in the truth we declare the truth we experience it right we experience the power of god's word so here we see that um, uh, just a minute sorry so here we see that paul is saying you know this is what it is this is what the lord said that the the, the bread signifies the body the lord himself carrying our sin our sickness everything on the cross and the cup it signifies his blood that was shed for us that sacrifice and also that covenant the new covenant that we have in the blood okay so what was happening there in the corinthian church it was becoming uh, this whole aspect of communion communion was become a has become something like a feast okay well there's nothing wrong but the fact is that they were not acknowledging what the lord did for them on the cross they had you know it had become a ritual without meaning right it had become a tradition without the without people acknowledging the truth or the powerful truth what it's what it actually was pointing to okay so something was happening there and uh, paul was addressing this instead of receiving the blessing okay because it's it's um, you know if you look at um, um chapter 10 okay if you look at chapter 10 and uh, verse 16 right what does he say you know this is a cup of blessing okay the cup that we drink of it's a cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of christ the bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of christ so you know it's that fellowship is that oneness is that sharing um, that we we receive from the the body and the blood of jesus 
at what has happened there. Is it, it, it says it's the communion, it's the fellowship, it's the sharing, it's uh, it's us receiving what had happened. Okay, um, and what the Lord was actually imparting to us, the victory over sin, the 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 power of um, the power and the authority uh, of breaking the hold of the enemy, everything, the Lord was actually, you know, sharing with us, communing, communion uh, with us, right? So when we, when, we, when we did that, when we do that, every time we do that. So, um, so Paul was saying that, you know, now you're not doing that order. You are coming to just get together and eat and drink. Now that's becoming a problem and also even in that eating and drinking, you know, it's like um, there are divisions. Okay, um, chapter 11, verse uh, 17, uh, 18 talks about, you know, they, okay, there are divisions, there are factions, you know, which means there are groups, right? And uh, those who seem to be leaders, right? you, uh, you want to be recognized among the people, right? All these things are happening. Um, Plus, what is happening is they were not acknowledging, they were taking communion in an unworthy manner. Okay. Now let's look at 27, saying, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty, the body and blood of the Lord, sorry, um, body and blood of the Lord, but let a man examine himself, he says, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Okay. So now when we don't eat in a worthy manner, if we take part in communion in an unworthy manner, not recognizing what it means, not acknowledging what it actually is, um, so, and we eat in a reverential manner, you know, then what happens is, it says that that person will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat uh, uh, eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For if he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now what is happening there? What is happening is that instead of this being an act which um, of communion, which brings blessing, Right. Because you're doing it in an unworthy manner, um, instead of uh, you know the the, uh, the blessing in the sense the curse being uh, broken or addictions being broken or you know if there's any remnant of any sickness or symptoms of sickness, um, you know receiving healing. Instead of that, he's saying that um, uh, verse thirty. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you. See, the opposite is happening. Many are sick and weak uh, among you, and many sleep, in the sense. Uh, many have even, you know, because of their sickness, because of their weakness, they have even passed away. And they, are, they have died. So, um, so actually, it's a cup of blessing. It is supposed to bring health and healing and wholeness because you're proclaiming what the, what the Lord did on the cross. He took our sin, He took our sickness, He took our curse, and reversed Right? He destroyed the body of sin so that we might enjoy the benefit of what he did for us on the cross, so that we might enjoy salvation, receive salvation, receive forgiveness, receive blessing, right? and every curse being broken and the power of the enemy being broken. So this is what we receive. But instead of that, you know, we are, because you're not acknowledging the truth, what is happening? You're placing yourself in a position to the attack of the enemy, right? You're moving yourself away from the truth. So what is happening? You're drinking judgment upon yourself, right? You're not coming under the Lord's all protection. You yourself, you're moving away, and therefore, what is happening is you're you would you're drinking, saying you're eating and drinking judgment, not discerning the Lord's body, saying let. The person examine, right? Uh, in, in meaning, investigate, check. Am I doing it the right way? Okay. Um, now, 
Um, excuse me. Sometimes people say, you know, um, excuse me, you need to come uh, and take part in communion only after having asked forgiveness. Okay, having cleansed. If you have not done so, you know, uh, if you have not asked forgiveness, if you have not uh, in a right relationship with the Lord, then don't take communion. Okay. Um, I've heard people say that, you know, if you're not in a right relationship with the Lord, don't take communion. Uh, if you've not asked forgiveness, don't take communion. But the fact is, we need to remember that communion actually refers to the cross. Okay, So in taking communion, in taking part in the Lord's Supper, we are actually asking forgiveness. We are actually saying, Lord, you took my sin on the cross. Right? By being part of it and by um, taking that step in order to take part in communion, what are we acknowledging? We are acknowledging that, Lord, Lord I know that you took my sins on the cross. Right? And I, I thank you that you know, I can receive forgiveness. And I'm sorry that you know, I, I did this. Uh, you know, these things of the flesh or whatever. You know, I, I didn't obey you. I disobeyed you intentionally, unintentionally. Uh, I'm sorry I, I did that, but I repent of that. You know, I make a choice now not to do that. And I receive the forgiveness that comes from the cross because of what you did for me on the cross. So that is what you you and I are actually proclaiming when we take part in the communion. So, so when we say, you know, you need to get cleaned up, you need to become uh, in a way, you know, like holy uh, or come to a place of uh, holiness and then only take part commun take part in the communion, you know, that is not correct. That is incorrect. Okay. Now, that is not what Paul is saying here. Let a man examine himself. Um, so what is happening here? They are not discerning, you know, they are not understanding, acknowledging what the Lord Jesus did for them on the cross. Okay, so it is he's referring to that and he's saying, you know, don't take it in an unworthy manner. So when we say, when we tell people, you know, um, you need you're taking it in an unworthy manner. If you've sinned, then get right with God and then only take part. You know, that is not correct. Right? That is not taking part in unworthy. It is for the sinner. Right? For the person who have accepted the Lord, of course, person who has the understanding of what has happened on the cross. And so with that understanding, you proclaim saying, I belong to Jesus. I know that he took my sin on the cross. I proclaim that he took all the curse on the cross. I proclaim that he, um, you know, the enemy's hold over my life is broken. I belong to Jesus. I've been redeemed and I'm his purchased position. You know, we come to that place of acknowledging that in taking communion. Right? So that is taking communion in a worthy manner. And uh, not in an unworthy manner, right? So then he says, um, "So we uh, that, but if we would judge ourselves, so this is the, the I'm sorry, verse thirty. This is what he says. You know, um, for this reason, because people are taking an unworthy manner, many are weak, many are sick, and many have even uh, are even us, uh, uh, many even sleep. Meaning that uh, you know this is what has happened. They have died, um, and so he's writing and to warn them." And he says, um, you know, do it in a proper manner, right? So he says in verse 33, therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, so let it not turn into a, a, a feast where people are eating and one person is hungry and they don't have enough. Let it not, let it not, it's not that. You know, if you're hungry, you eat at home. Okay. Uh, and uh, of course, in, you know, in today's uh, church, you know, uh, we serve wafer, we serve, and there are places where they serve bread uh, and so on. So, um, so he says, if anyone is hungry, you know, don't treat this as something to quench your physical hunger. Okay? If anyone is hungry, you eat at home and then you come. Right? Let them eat at home, lest you come together for judgment and the rest I will set in order when I come. Okay? So, I hope we understand, you know, why he says, "Do not eat and drink in an unworthy manner." The Lord's Supper, right? So um, this is the uh, this is the reason. 
that he says and uh, and he says you know the outcome or the result of eating in an unworthy manner is this it's it's quite serious why it's not because people are you know uh, you know they have, have not confessed their sins they have not acknowledged their sins it's not because of that it's because they have not acknowledged what jesus did for them on the good to teach uh, yeah, you know people about him in in the church and say okay this is for believers right this is this is for those who have um who have accepted the lord as lord and savior and those who proclaim that this is what the lord did for me okay who, who believe that who acknowledge that who agree this is what it is because a person who's not accepted the lord well uh, he or she does not believe that right does not believe that uh, that Jesus died on the cross. So for that person, um, the whole thing of communion is, it doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make sense. It does it's, uh, they do it in ignorance. It doesn't make sense. It's just a mere form or ritual without meaning. So it's good to teach in the church. And, and, and that's why, you know, many people teach and say, okay, this is why we take part in the communion and therefore we'll do it with the understanding, with the, with the knowledge and understanding. And it, it it's a powerful time, a powerful time because we are proclaiming the truth and because of which, uh, because of your, our agreement with the truth and because of a proclamation of the truth, we see, we enforce, you know, we affirm and enforce what the Lord did for us and receive in our body, in our mind, in our life, uh, the benefit, right, what the Lord Jesus did for us the fruit of that we receive that in our lives if the enemy is trying to do something and if we have you know unintentionally we've opened the door and made space for the enemy to come in you know because of our anger because of our bitterness because of our unforgiveness uh, because of dabbling in you know things of the lust and the lust, you know, lust of the flesh and so on um, now that effectively you know brings an end to that brings an end to the we close and we shut the open door and we say no no more because this on the cross my lord jesus did this on the cross and i i i declare that again i recommit um you know myself to that truth again right okay any questions here okay any questions about uh, communion, about uh, you know, taking part of the communion in an unworthy manner, right? Okay, um, okay. If there are no questions, then uh, we will move on to chapter twelve. Okay, so we've covered up to chapter eleven. Um, so chapter twelve is what we look at now. Chapter uh, when, when we move on to the next section. Chapter 12, 13, and 14, Paul addresses uh, like a, a singular theme, uh, one topic, which is about uh, the gifts of the Spirit. Okay, so he's addressing uh, gifts of the Spirit, what they are. He, in fact, gives a list how they should be used in church, uh, how, uh, you know, what, what is it for, and, and also, uh, you know, cautions them about the motives of the attitudes with which uh, these gifts need to be used uh, or ministered to uh, and so on right so right from 12 up to 14 he's talking about the same thing right um, and and obviously this was also one one uh, one aspect or an issue in the church okay so uh, things were not really happening the way it should be even though the they were all, uh, you know, most of them. Uh, from what we see, we see that they were all filled with the Spirit, and they were, they were, had the understanding of gifts, and um, and they were walking in the gifts. Right? It was prevalent in their uh, church, in the fellowship. Right. So let's uh, let's start with uh, chapter twelve. Okay. Um, and we have we have studied this before, and maybe in the weekend school, in the Holy Spirit class, um, you know, we've have, we've have studied this. So it it's a uh, it's a reiteration, so uh, it's a revision of those things that we've already learned, right? Okay, um, so let's look at uh, chapter 12. Okay, um, 
just one second. Okay, chapter 12. <clears throat> Let's begin from verse uh, verse one. Now concerning spiritual gifts, okay. So he's going to talk about spiritual gifts. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were uh, Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another uh, working of miracles, to another prophecy, um, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Okay, so, um, so Paul is saying that, okay, now we're going to talk about spiritual gifts. And the first thing is, is I do not want you to be ignorant, meaning, you know, you should have an understanding of the spiritual gifts. Okay, and the word used there, for spiritual gifts, is using the word um, pneuma, pneumaticos, which means something that is not of the flesh. Okay, something that is not of the natural, uh, naturally, um, you know, uh, learned or trained, which comes from natural training, right? Something, something that is out of natural origin, um, non-carnal. So something that is supernatural. Okay, so, uh, so concerning these spiritual gifts, so which means you know, um, these are not natural abilities. Like we might have natural talents, right? Uh, probably to sing, you know, play, make music, or you know, someone can be uh, very athletic, you know, like very, they can run very fast. So these are natural abilities, you know, something that you are born with, something that you train to do, etc. You know, natural, maybe very strong, you know, and so on. So these are supernatural. You know, uh, pneumatic cause, which means that these are uh, not natural or not carnal. Uh, these are supernatural. So the origin is uh, is God. It's not something that you, you know, learn through natural means. Now, God wants us, God's will and desire is that we don't stay ignorant about these gifts. That he wants us to learn, know about these gifts. Okay. Uh, verse 2, you know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols however you were led so when you you know you you this is what this was your background you were an idolatry um and you worship these idols and so he says that you know you were uh, carried away right you were swayed and uh, by all this uh, what what was happening around you by the environment and you were carried away to these idols which were voiceless Right. In other words, he's saying these were not capable of speaking, speaking to you, guiding you, right, instructing you. These were dumb. You know, when you the use uh, the, sometimes we uh, use the word dumb in order to mean uh, people who don't know anything. You know, but that's not the meaning here. He's saying dumb in the sense that these these are in, incapable of speaking, directing, articulating, communicating, right. So uh, you were carried out, you know, to this, to these things. Okay. Therefore, he's saying, uh, no one who speaks, no, no one speaking by the Holy Spirit calls Jesus accursed, and uh, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Okay. So uh, that's one thing that we are the uh, first thing that we see that. Uh, Paul is emphasizing, you know, the idols could not speak, could not direct. Um, where in a in a way they he's saying they are dumb in the sense they could not 
express themselves. But here he's saying the Holy Spirit, right? No one speaking by the Holy Spirit, which means the Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, um, speaks through man, right? And when he speaks through man, he will acknowledge Jesus. He will not call Jesus as accursed, but he will say Jesus is Lord. He will exalt Jesus, lift up the name of Jesus, and agree that Jesus is indeed Lord, You know, which is what the Lord Jesus taught. Right? If you look at John chapter 14 and John chapter 15, um, this is what the Lord Jesus taught the disciples. He said, you know, um, the Holy Spirit, he will testify of me. He will exalt. Right? He will exalt the name of Jesus um, and, and so on. So, um, so same thing Paul is saying, you know, no one speaking by the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, you know, these idols could not speak. Now God speaks. He speaks to us. He speaks through us. Right? So no one speaking by the Holy Spirit uh, uh, bringing a message about God or from God uh, by the work of the Spirit will call Jesus accursed or will not acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. So the fact that a person acknowledges uh, from their heart that Jesus is Lord is because of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's life and through a person's life. Okay, so um, this is one of the things that uh, when we, when we, especially when we're studying about gifts, to understand that um, when the Holy Spirit speaks through a person, it is never to put down Jesus, right? It's it's never to uh, even when we are working, you know, manifesting and uh, I mean, sorry, doing uh, ministering uh, through the gifts, it is never to exalt ourselves above the name of Jesus because uh, He, His name, uh, He is Lord. We are not, right? So therefore, his name is exalted above every other name, above the names of, uh, above even us, ourselves. Right? So his name is exalted. Okay. Then uh, verse 4, there are diversities of gifts or there are, you know, different kinds okay, of gifts, varieties, but it's the same Holy Spirit. And the word used there for gifts is... Uh, you know, gifts of grace, which means that it's something that is uh, unmerited. It is, uh, it is uh, a gift of grace, something that we do not earn, something that we receive freely uh, from, from God, freely from the Holy Spirit. Right. So these are gifts of grace, uh, freely given, not earned. Okay. He doesn't give it because you memorize so many verses or studied so many. You know books of the Bible, or know so much, uh, you know uh, about the Bible. No, these are given because of grace, right? Uh, unmerited. So uh, these are given. So we do not earn it, and these are gifts of grace. So there are diversities of gifts, different kinds of gifts, but the gifts come from the same Spirit. <clears throat> Verse five. There are differences of ministries. Right, um, different kinds of serving, uh, different ways of uh, you know serving, different kinds of ministries uh, or ministry offices like the fivefold ministry, but it is the <clears throat> same Lord. It is the same Lord, even though there might be different ways uh, of different ministries, different ways of serving. It is the same Lord. Okay, then there could be diversities of activities and the word used there is, is energema in greek meaning workings or uh, effective workings or uh, manifestations right and uh, referring to the supernatural works right there could be differences or different activities energema uh, different uh, manifestations of the spirit but it is the same god okay it is the same God who works in all. So he's saying, you know, the, when it comes to gifts, when it comes to uh, activities, when it, uh, when it comes to ministries, the source is God. It is the same Holy Spirit. It is the same, you know, uh, the Lord Jesus. It is the same God. You know, he, he uses different uh, terms, right? Uh, for in verse four, it says it is the same Spirit. Different diversity of gifts. Then. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord, okay, uh, referring to the Lord Jesus. 
and there are diversities of activities but is the same god who works all in all referring to the father so we can look at it in both ways we can say okay it's the same uh, you know same lord jesus the same spirit the same uh, father who works all or we can say you know it is the same holy spirit who imparts these gifts who gives this different kinds of ministries and <clears throat> different uh, kinds of varieties of activities that work through the spirit okay so <clears throat> so there are different kinds of um, ministries these are different kinds of activities um which uh, uh, you know which fulfill or result in certain objectives but it's for the same purpose um that uh, people will be benefited helped and um uh, it is from god from the same source right verse 7 talks about that the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one okay so the manifestation of the spirit the the tangible uh, uh what do you call um uh making visible um work of the spirit the manifestation right so the manifestation of spirit is given to each one or is given to all okay like in a congregation is given to all is given to each one what is the reason it is for the profit of all it is for the benefit of all okay so um so every which means that uh, the holy spirit comes with all these gifts and every believer can have all the gifts of the spirit or move in the gifts because the holy spirit uh, can release all these gifts through the believing to the believer okay um and then verses 8 to 10 he goes on to list down okay what are these gifts okay what are these gifts uh, and um, okay so we'll take a break and then we'll we'll come back right we'll take a break for 10 minutes and come back <laughs> 